alive without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if flashing seas leap everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare. A constant sense of thy abiding presence, where'er I am, to feel that thou art near. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness o'ertakes me, when I must weep amid the fires of pain, and when shall come the hour of my departure, for worlds unknown, O Lord, be with me then. Good evening. We thank you so much for joining us again for our Wednesday evening Bible study here at the Washington Street Church of Christ. We are studying from the book entitled Amazed by Jesus. We're in volume one of two, and we are in lesson seven, and we will begin in lesson seven this evening. Before we get started, however, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening to study your word. We thank you for the words that you've given us. We thank you for the paper and the ink that has written them down. Father, we pray that as we study your word, we will understand it and we will apply it to our lives. Father, help us to teach the gospel to everybody that we can. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so we're picking up in Lesson 7 on about page 109. Lesson 7, about page 109. Under the heading, Ministry and Rejection at Home. So last week we finished up by talking about Jesus' healings and, and, and the amazement that people had uh, over him. And of course we will continue that in this lesson as well because it never really stopped. Jesus was always fascinating people. He was healing people. He was teaching people. And they would always be really satisfied with what he did. But under the heading, Ministry and Rejection at Home, we turn to Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. So, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him, 
and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you, truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Then he went to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. So here we have a Jewish synagogue. Now the Jewish synagogue served as the center of the first century urban community. Though the word synagogue is never mentioned in the Old Testament, it became a prominent fixture during the time between the Testaments. And during the week, secular activities and, and community services would be offered at the synagogue. But on the Sabbath, all of that stopped and people would gather for worship and to, and to study the scriptures. Now, throughout his ministry, Jesus would spend a lot of time in the synagogues. And he would like to be there on the Sabbath days so he could teach and perform miracles for those who were religious who were taking part in the services. Now, this particular Sabbath, Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth. He was handed a scroll that contained words from the prophet Isaiah, and he read from it. After reading from it, he handed it back, and, and he prepared himself to speak to the crowd. Now, these folks would have been people who grew up with Jesus, who he grew up around, who watched him grow up. And they were probably excited about his growing fame as a miracle worker. They were probably excited to hear him. So everyone got really quiet, and they anxiously awaited what he had to say. And he said, after reading, he said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, that's not quite what they expected to hear. Everybody knew he was talking about the passage that he had just read from Isaiah, and they knew it was talking about the Messiah. So if he was telling, talking to them about the Messiah, he must have been telling them that he was the Messiah. And they just couldn't believe that. There was no way that little old Jesus is the Messiah, the one they watched grow up. They couldn't believe that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. And then Jesus really made them mad. He talked about a couple of miracles that were performed in the Old Testament, how um, Elijah had provided food for a Gentile widow and her son during a drought from 1 Kings 17. And he talked about how Elisha, healed a Gentile man of leprosy. In both cases, Jews were overlooked because of their unbelief. So Jesus was making a point here. And the crowd gets his point. They didn't like it. They were angry at him and they wanted to kill him, but they got the point. But Jesus would sneak away and, and he, would, he would escape death at that time. But he would return a few months later to Nazareth and give his fellow Nazarenes a chance to follow him. However, they would reject him again. So he moves on to Capernaum at this point. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4 at verse 13. Matthew chapter 4 at verse 13. And after leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, 
by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So Capernaum was Jesus' base of operation. It had a population of around 1,500 people and was considered a major city in the region. It was located just to uh, the northwest of the Sea of Galilee and was a major trade route. People went right through it all the time, spending a lot of time and money there. And uh, Jesus spending a lot of time there was part of his strategy. You see, thousands of people would travel through Capernaum to go to different places and to trade and to do those types of things. So a lot of people would witness Jesus and end up carrying word of him far and wide. Some of his disciples lived and worked in Capernaum. So this was another good reason to base your operations out of there. Matthew was a tax collector at the local synagogue, and Peter and Andrew were fishermen in Capernaum. And while he was there, Jesus actually lived in Peter's home. Now, people in Capernaum were a little more accepting than the folks in other places like Nazareth. Other places, Jesus was criticized, especially when performing miracles on the Sabbath, but not in Capernaum. Although they had trouble believing that he was the Messiah, they were happy to have him there and performing miracles. So, Throughout his ministry in and around Capernaum, Jesus would use miracles to reinforce his teachings. He performed several recorded miracles while in Capernaum, including healings, exorcisms, demonstrations of power over nature. Of course, other words are used to describe the miracles in the Gospels, like signs and wonders and, and mighty works. But his miracles proved that he was from God and was God, and they were also a great teaching tool. So many people would listen to Jesus when they saw him perform a miracle because they knew he was important. And then we come to Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Luke chapter 5, beginning with, with verse 1, and where Jesus calls his first four disciples. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let my net down. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that the boat began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. So there were plenty of rabbis during Jesus' time on earth. Those rabbis had followers. People would follow them in order to learn from them about the law of Moses. But the Jewish rabbis didn't have the same expectations that Jesus had of his disciples. One example is the fact that Jesus told his disciples to quit their jobs and follow him. The Jewish rabbis didn't expect their disciples to do that. Now, Jesus wanted his disciples to follow him full time. And not only did he want them to leave their jobs, but their families too. Jesus wanted them to understand that commitment meant leaving everything behind. 
Jesus' first disciples were two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, and James and John. He had first encountered them over a year before when he first began his ministry. However, they had all gone back to their daily lives after they first met Jesus previously. Now, Jesus would get their attention with nothing else than a miracle. You see, after fishing all night long, Peter had caught nothing. Jesus tells him to cast into the deep and they will catch fish. Jesus really told them to do exactly what they wouldn't normally do. But Peter did what he said. He was shocked with what happened next. That massive amount of fish that had been caught. They had seen Jesus perform miracles before, and Peter knew that this was another one. But Peter was totally amazed at Jesus' dramatic display of, of power over nature. Peter got out of the boat. He bowed before Jesus, and he said, I am not worthy. Now, it was at this time that he called Peter to be one of his permanent disciples. So Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishing partners who would become soul winners for Jesus. Now we move on to Mark chapter 1 at verse 21, talking about teaching in the synagogue and healing. Teaching in the synagogue and healing, which brings us to page 114 in our books. But let's read Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man there in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now if we look on page 114, down there at the last paragraphs, under teaching in the synagogue and a healing, it says, throughout his ministry, Jesus stayed busy. Over a 24-hour period, Jesus worked at a nonstop pace, which is characteristic of of his entire ministry. He began the Sabbath in the Capernaum synagogue. Late in the afternoon, he goes to Peter's home for an evening meal. Jesus spends the remainder of his evening healing. Then early in the morning, Peter finds him praying alone, and then, uh, then Jesus begins a whole new day of teaching and healing. So first, while he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, Jesus performed an exorcism. A man was possessed by a demon, but this demon actually confessed that Jesus is the Messiah. There were followers of Jesus that weren't even convinced, but this demon knew who Jesus was. And of course, we see here that just because one knows and confesses and even believes that Jesus is the Lord doesn't mean that they are safe. Now, Jesus rebuked the demon and he demanded that he come out of the man. And he did. And the people around were amazed. He showed them a miracle and, and taught them with authority. He didn't have to get approval or reassurance from any of the religious leaders to do these things. And his words and wisdom were far more penetrating than anyone else's. So the people took notice. Continuing his day in Mark 1 verse 29 we see Peter's mother-in-law healed. It says, Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, 
and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. So, after leaving the synagogue during Jesus' busy day, he and his disciples go to Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law was there, and she was sick with a fever. Now Jesus would heal her, and she would feel good enough to serve them dinner. And as the day drew to a close, many people came to Peter's house. Jesus would heal those who were afflicted and, and had demons, and he would forbid the demons to confess him, though, as Lord. And then later in verse 35, we read, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Then they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I might preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and casting out demons. So the next morning, Jesus went out by himself to pray. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to be able to concentrate on his prayer. He didn't want people constantly coming to him and, and, and wanting healed or, or whatever the case may be or asking him questions. So, so Peter and the, the disciples would search for him and they would finally find, found him in, in a secluded area. And Peter told him that all these people were looking for him. At that time, Jesus said, well, let's, let's go elsewhere and preach. Let's, let's get out of here. Now, his mission was to preach, and he wanted to preach to as many people as possible. This might have caused Peter to think a little bit, well, why does he want to leave when things are going so well? But, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And he had many more people who needed to hear the gospel, many more people who needed to be healed. Let's continue in Mark chapter 1 at verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. So we see... Jesus healing yet again. Jesus would, would continue to heal. He would continue to, to teach. But leaving Capernaum here, he traveled to one of the neighboring cities that, uh, that lies along the Sea of Galilee. And even as the Jews of Judea flocked to hear John, the Galileans would want to hear Jesus as well. His popularity, of course, was just getting um, bigger and bigger. Uh, his fame was rising. And, and one particular miracle that we read here seemed to catch the attention of the Pharisees. Though they couldn't deny the power of his miracles, they certainly questioned Jesus's tactics and, 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 and the way that he healed on the Sabbath. They didn't like it very well. And uh, he felt, they felt that he was violating authority. But when this leper approached Jesus, his heart went out to this man. He was concerned about this man. 
and then he simply touched him. You see, normally this act would have made someone ritually unclean, but not Jesus. His touch cleansed the leper. Nobody wanted to touch a leper. They didn't want to get leprosy. They didn't want to be unclean. But the first thing Jesus did was touch the leper. And then he said to him, Don't tell anybody that I have cleansed you, but go show yourself to the priest. And he instructed him to stay quiet about it. Now, of course, the leper, not being a leper anymore, he found it quite impossible to contain his excitement. So as a result, even more people sought Jesus so that he could work miracles for them. Of course, this forced Jesus to find other places that were, that were a little out of the way so that he could accommodate the crowds. And then the, the, the village priest certified the healing of the leper. He was expected to report the, the cleansing to the religious leaders. Now, having been made aware of Jesus' miraculous powers, the, the Pharisees began to take notice of Jesus. They would criticize him at every chance they got. But one of the main reasons they objected to him because, was because he disregarded their traditions, mainly because he went beyond his uh, authority by healing on the Sabbath. And of course, soon enough, they would plot to eliminate him. If you look there on page 116 at figure 27, you see a series of controversies with the Pharisees. And it shows us the section title, the location, the critics, and the first one there, forgiving and healing of a paralytic, which happened in Capernaum, and the scribes and the Pharisees didn't like it. The call of Matthew in Capernaum, the Pharisees were pretty critical. Jesus defends his disciples for feasting in Capernaum. Pharisees and even John's disciples were a little critical. Jesus heals an invalid on the Sabbath in Jerusalem. The Pharisees and, and the Jews were critical of him there. Jesus defends the picking of grain on the Sabbath around Galilee, perhaps. The Pharisees got mad at him there. And, and then the healing of the man's hand on the Sabbath um, in a Galilean synagogue, the Pharisees were upset with him as well. But we see throughout Jesus' ministry the, the things that he did that upset the religious people, the leaders, and all the miracles that he performed. And the ones that were done on the Sabbath made people mad because it was questioning their authority. And people didn't like that. But Jesus would perform so many miracles during his time of ministry on earth. Let's turn back to page 112 and, and look at his miracles. Page 112 in figure um, 26. The first miracle we remember, he turned water into wine and he, he healed the, the nobleman's son of a fever. And then he escaped from the hostile people, the multitude who, who were around him, who wanted to kill him. And uh, Numbers 4 through 9 here actually happened while he was in Capernaum. Uh, the first catch of fish, then he cast out the unclean spirit. Then he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then he continued to heal the sick in the evening, cleansed the leper, and healed the paralytic. And then as he moves on, we see him healing the, the man at the pool of Bethsaida, or Bethesda, and healing the man's withered hand. He would go on to, to heal a centurion's paralyzed servant, raising a widow's son, curing a demon-possessed uh, man who was blind and mute. Then he remember when he storms, uh, the storm is on the Sea of Galilee, and he stills that storm. Uh, and, and then uh, further on, when the, the demons enter the herd of swine, we remember that. So many miracles that Jesus performed throughout his ministry. And he does it up, up, up until the, the time for him to go. You remember he even healed 
the soldier's ear uh, when it was cut off the night that he was betrayed. We have so many things going on in our world today. It's easy to forget what Jesus has done for us. It's easy for us to forget the miracles that he did and the people who saw these miracles, who were amazed by them and who, because of those miracles, listened to Jesus because of what they saw. We forget that Jesus was rejected in his hometown because they didn't think that he could be what he said he was. We forget that that he had to move to other cities and keep moving because people were constantly wanting to kill him. But people were also constantly wanting to be around him and be healed by him. We forget that he didn't even have a home, that he was a born traveler, and, and that he, he would go anywhere and everywhere it took to gain disciples so that people could go to heaven. But today in our world, we allow politics and government and family matters and, and, and entertainment and things like that to, to make us forget about these things. We can't do that. We've got to remember what Jesus has done for us. We've got to be amazed by Jesus, just as these people were in these scriptures. We must end here this evening at this point, but I don't want you to forget about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that he is the son of God, that he died on the cross to save us from our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day and he sits with God, the Father in heaven. Don't forget these things, because it's these things that you must believe and follow in order to get to heaven. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Have you even heard about it? Perhaps not. If we can help you learn these things, let us know. Have you believed that Jesus died on the cross? Have you repented of your sins, confessed Jesus as Lord, and been baptized for the forgiveness of sins? If not, don't wait till it's too late. Perhaps you have been a Christian in the past and you have fallen away and you want Jesus back in your life. Come back to him through repentance and prayer to God. And if we can help you, let us know. My name is Scott Pauley. I'm the minister for the Washington Street Church of Christ. We meet at 601 Washington Street in St. Albans, West Virginia. At this time, we're meeting at 930 for Bible study on Sunday morning and 1030 for worship service. Feel free to come see us. Everything will be broadcast on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page. So seek those out and like those so you can always know when we're bringing a lesson to you. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face i see but i know whom i have
have believed it and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day.